Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the latest of our European Parliamentary Research Service roundtables. This is an EU history roundtable. I'm Anthony Teasdale from the EPRS, and I'm delighted to welcome not only you as participants following and hopefully contributing to the discussion, because there'll be plenty of opportunity for questions and answers after our speakers have uh, intervened, but also to welcome a world-class panel of experts, writers about the process of European integration, including the history of the EU and the dynamics of today's European Union. Desmond Dynan, Sergio Fabrini, Heather Graby, and Andrew Mravchik. I'll introduce each of those very briefly uh, when they come to um, share their thinking about the contribution which Jean Monnet made to the history of European integration. 70 years this last weekend, it was the signature of the Treaty of Paris, which established the European coal and steel community. And of course, Monet played a critical role with his close colleague and um, collaborator, Pierre Uri, in the drafting of the Schumann Declaration in 1950, and he chaired the intergovernmental conference that led to the Coal and Steel Community Treaty. Now, this was a ingenious solution to an acute problem which the government in Paris faced of how to reconcile deeply hostile French parliamentary and public opinion to the reindustrialization of Germany, which the Americans, the British, and the Germans themselves felt essential to the economic survival of post war Western Europe. This notion of Deep sovereignty sharing in the sectors of coal and steel was a really radical proposition. And the idea of creating supranational institutions, institutions above the nation state, with freestanding law and their own judicial uh, interpretation, which would ensure the prevalence of that law, was pathbreaking. And of course, uh, contrary to the prevailing orthodoxy in many other uh, nation states around the world. Um, it marked them out, the founding fathers and John Monet, perhaps in particular from many of their contemporaries who were still locked into the logic of the nation state and um, the confines of national borders. Now, before we uh, proceed to our discussion about the uh, way in which Monet changed the history of Europe and look back over the last 70 years, we're very privileged to have a, a short video recording, which was uh, actually um, made only yesterday in France uh, with uh, somebody called Georges Bertoin, a retired French civil servant who worked with Monet when Monet became the president of the, the first president of the new high authority of the coal and steel community. And Bertoin will share with us his thinking about the significance of those events 70 years ago. And you may want to enlarge it to full screen uh, as and when it comes on stream. Here it is. Bon, mesdames, Messieurs, le colloque qui va commencer célèbre les 70 ans de la signature du traité de Paris. Ce traité, après un an de négociation entre six États, incorporé dans la politique et dans l'histoire internationale, et dans le destin de chacun de ces pays, le contenu de la déclaration faite par Robert Schuman le 9 mai 1950 est inspirée par Jean Monnet. Cette, euh, les buts de ce traité et de cette déclaration étaient simples. D'abord, créer des conditions de ce qu'il appelait lui-même une paix durable. Pour cela, il ouvrait un chemin dont la, le processus de progression était également indiqué et nouveau. Il s'agissait non pas de procéder par imposition, mais par évidence. On rendait à l'occasion d'un problème qui apparaissait clairement à tout le monde euh, la, 
possibilité de le résoudre, même si, par tradition, certains d'entre eux étaient insolvables. La méthode consistait à procéder par étapes et répondre à des défis qui étaient reconnus par tout le monde et qui de cela formaient un élément commun qui serait la légitimité de l'action proposée. Pour donner un exemple, lorsque le canal de Suez a été nationalisé par le colonel Nasser, tous les Européens ont senti une, une insécurité était possible dans leur ravitaillement en pétrole. C'est à ce moment-là que Monet a suggéré d'avoir une industrie européenne du nucléaire et que la création de Ratom, alors qu'il s'agissait d'une matière extrêmement compliquée sur le plan technique et politique, et militaire aussi, Euratom a été facilement, le traité de Euratom a été facilement négocié et accepté et ratifié. Aujourd'hui, nous avons une série de problèmes, surtout après le déclenchement d'une épidémie mondiale, toute série de problèmes qui apparaissent à peu près sous les mêmes angles par l'ensemble du monde, et notamment, et sûrement, par les pays européens. Et c'est bien que aujourd'hui, ce qui apparaissait il y a 70 ans comme un, un pari invraisemblable et un acte de foi de quelques-uns, apparaît aujourd'hui comme une nécessité, une évidence à un beaucoup plus grand nombre autant parmi les partisans que les adversaires de l'unité européenne. La réponse, la, la question qui se pose, est-ce que la méthode Monet pourrait être encore utile D'abord, entre nous, nous disions toujours qu'il n'existait pas une méthode Monet. C'était, euh, s'il y avait une méthode, c'était la recherche d'engager le maximum d'acteurs politiques et sociaux dans la constatation qu'il était meilleur de travailler ensemble qu'en ordre dispersé et que la réorganisation de souveraineté nationale que tous les pays d'Europe organisaient après la guerre car c'était un chaos économique, social et institutionnel et moral. Et là, lorsque cette évidence s'imposerait, une nouvelle légitimité européenne serait créée. Et une fois qu'elle serait créée, les institutions qui auraient permis ce développement feraient elles-mêmes le travail que toute institution doit faire. D'ailleurs, la réponse de Monet, c'est lui-même qui a donné cette question. C'est lui-même. Et, et en 1975, il m'a dit, il m'annonce qu'il allait dissoudre le comité d'action pour les États-Unis et l'Europe qu'il avait créé et qui a eu une importance considérable et même certains disent décisive dans la formation et la ratification du traité de Rome. Lorsqu'il lorsqu m'annonce euh, euh, la fin de son comité d'action, je m'inquiète et je lui demande « Mais qui va continuer vo votre œuvre ?» Et voilà ce qu'il m'a répondu, et là je vais lire exactement les mots que j'avais pris en note à l'époque. Il dit 
Alors là, il faut que ces nouvelles machines... Il dit, voilà. D'abord, on m'a posé la question récemment. Il serait évidemment indécent de répondre, pour moi de répondre à sa place, mais voilà ce que j'avais noté à l'époque. Je lui pose la question, qui continuera votre œuvre Et il répond sans la moindre hésitation. Le Parlement européen, bien sûr, car ce sont les peuples qui tout naturellement devront continuer à travers l'action de leurs représentants ce que nous avons commencé pour eux. Je crois que la réponse, sa réponse est claire. Je pense qu'elle pouvait ou qu'elle peut figurer au début de ce colloque. Ce n'est pas une imposition, c'est une évidence. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was Georges Bertrand who was the chef de cabinet to Jean Monnet during his time, during the three years that Jean Monnet was president of the high authority of the coal and steel community, speaking yesterday in France uh, with this special message for this particular seminar. And I think it's, um, it's both touching and it's a privilege to hear from him with those words directly. As somebody who knew and worked with Monet extremely closely, we're also privileged to have among uh, our audience, I notice, uh, this afternoon, René Haberkamp, who knew uh, Jean Monet personally and indeed uh, worked as a researcher uh, to Paul Henri Spark. Welcome, René. So the question really is what was the Monet method? How far did it make a difference? How radical was it? And how far has it shaped the evolution of the process of European integration? And to touch on these questions and reflect more generally on the political significance of Monet, we have um, four really excellent speakers. And thank you so much for sparing your time to join us here in this event. And I'm going to ask first Desmond Dynan, who's Professor of Public Policy at the School of Policy, Government and International Affairs at the George Mason University, just outside Washington, DC and author of several books, both about the history of the European Union and its current political trajectory, Ever Closer Union, Europe Recast, and most recently, the European Union in Crisis. Thank you very much for joining us, Desmond. Over to you. Organizing this panel, what a pleasure to be able to talk about the history of the European Union. It's a, it's a rare treat. And to use Jean Monnet and, and the negotiations that led to the European Coal and Steel Community and the treaty itself as a hook, as you said, for a, a, a broad ranging discussion. And uh, what a treat as well to hear Monsieur Bertrand, uh, quite, quite remarkable um, that, that, that he was able to contribute as, as he did at the beginning of this, of this uh, seminar. That was, that was very, very nice. Um, what I thought that I would do is situate uh, Monet at the time of the negotiations for the Coal and Steel Community, at the time of the Schumann Declaration and the um, launch of the European Coal and Steel Community, um, and talk a little bit about, about his background and, and why he was so pivotal uh, in those events. And then maybe we can move on chronologically and, and thematically from that. Um, first of all, at the time of the Schumann Declaration, uh, which gave rise to the um, Coal and Steel Community, Monet, of course, was head of the office for uh, economic planning and, and modernization in France. He was a very senior French government official. He had been appointed to that position, interestingly enough, by none other than Charles de Gaulle. Uh, de Gaulle was, was president of our, our head of the provisional French government immediately after the war, wanted to set up a, a, an office for economic planning and modernization and chose Monet to do so. And that's interesting both because of the conflicts between de Gaulle and Monet subsequently, uh, they're, they're very different visions of Europe, but also because they already had a history. And I would say they already had a certain um, mutual distrust and dislike of each other. And it stemmed from uh, June 1940, that, that, that decisive and disastrous month in French and, and European history. 
uh, the time of the of the of the French military defeat, um, when when the British brought uh, de Gaulle to to London, and and de Gaulle made his famous uh, appeal on the 18th of, of June, um, and subsequently launched the Free French Movement. Perhaps the most senior French official who was in London at the time uh, that de Gaulle arrived was Monet, and of course de Gaulle invited Monet to join the Free French Movement, and Monet declined because he felt he did not want to be subservient to, to de Gaulle, who was relatively little known at the time. He did not know how effective de Gaulle would be. And Monet felt that the, his contribution could be in organizing the, the war effort, the, 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 the supply, the procurement effort, which he was already doing in London for France at that time, but he would be better able to do it in Washington. And so he moved to Washington, D.C., and he worked out of the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. on the Allied war effort. Now, that didn't endear him to de Gaulle either, by the way, the fact that he was located in the British Embassy. What's very important in understanding Monet's contribution subsequently is the years that he spent in Washington, uh, 1940 to 1943, because he was working there, as I said, for the Allied war effort out of the British Embassy, which was then located in downtown Washington, D.C., quite close to the White House, and quite close to the State Department, which at that time was in the old executive office building. So it was a relatively small space. And when I spent much of his time visiting the White House, he had extraordinary access to the White House and visiting the State Department. And he cultivated contacts that were going to be invaluable to him in the post-war period. And de Gaulle knew that. When de Gaulle appointed Monet to head the Office of Economic Planning, he did so because he knew that Monet had a, a reputation and, and an expertise in, in planning. But he also knew that Monet had the kinds of contacts in Washington and was known to officials in Washington, trusted by them, in a way, of course, at which de Gaulle was not. Now, de Gaulle resigned subsequently, as you know, and went into the political wilderness before coming back. And that's another story in the history of European integration. But I just want to make the point about how important it was to Monet and to Monet's success subsequently that he knew the Americans so well. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty obvious why, because in the immediate post-war period, the Americans were the kingmakers. The Americans were extremely influential in shaping post-war Europe, post-war Western Europe in particular, with the onset of the Cold War. And having the ear of the Americans uh, and being trusted by them was very important. And an immediate example of that is that Monet negotiated a very generous and a very favorable loan from the Americans two years before the Marshall Plan, but at a time when Congress in the United States was cutting back on, on foreign aid, it was not very open to the idea, but Monet managed to do that. Um, now, to bring the story forward a little bit, um, what Monet was doing in the Office of Economic Planning was not economic planning along Soviet lines. It was more indicative planning. It was gathering data, looking at the French economy overall, which was in the parallel state, of course, in the immediate post-war period. Um, discussing with uh, producers, other stakeholders, and of course, um, uh, French government ministers about how best the economy could be modernized. And a key aspect of the modernization of the French economy, of course, and key to the success of post-war economic reconstruction was the supply of coal and steel. French steel mills were antiquated. France wanted to use the opportunity of the post-war period, and frankly, the opportunity of Germany being down to modernize its steel mills. And of course, the basis of, 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 of uh, the production of steel um, was uh, through uh, the acquisition of, of high-grade coking coal. That coal was available not in France itself, but it was available in the Ruhr region of Western Germany. That was not in the French zone of occupation, but Ruhr coal production was under the control of the International Ruhr Authority in which France was represented. The Germans very much resented that. They wanted to get rid of that. The French used the opportunity of controls on the production by Germany of coal and the production of Germany by steel in a what was, in effect, a beggar thy neighbor policy to develop their own resources at this time. The problem with that is that it became unsustainable. With the launch of the Marshall Plan and the impact of the Marshall Plan, with the onset of the Cold War, the United States was very keen to get Germany, to allow Germany to develop economically fully. And this posed a very serious threat to the French model for economic uh, recovery in the immediate post-war period. And it posed a, a threat to, to, to Monet's planning. And so the Americans contacted Monet and said, look, we understand how France feels about this. We understand that removing controls on German production is going to be a threat to French economic security. 
but we can't have this policy. It's unsustainable anymore. Please help us to come up with a new, a new policy, a new approach. And that was the genesis of the, of the Schumann Declaration. And the, the, the key, of course, was the idea of taking control of, or, or oversight, if you like, management of the coal and steel sectors in France and, and in Germany from national control and transferring it to supranational authority. That was the novelty of the Schumann Declaration. Now, what, what challenges did, did Manet face um, in, 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 in succeeding with his plan? Um, you, you mentioned, Anthony, at, at the beginning of your introduction, that French public opinion, and certainly French political opinion, was against this. So even before the plan was made public in the Schumann Declaration, Monet knew that that would be the case. So what was the Monet method in effect? It was to seek individuals, or in particular an individual, who could successfully push this project through politically. And that individual was Robert Schumann. Uh, not surprisingly, of course, because Schumann was foreign minister, but also because Schumann was extremely sympathetic to the idea of Franco-German reconciliation. For Schumann, it was almost a spiritual objective. He was deeply religious. Monet was much more pragmatic, not particularly religious, and not political in the sense of belonging to a political party, but of course he was very political in how he worked. So the first thing was to get a, a, a powerful politician to promote this idea, and, and that was Robert Schumann. The second was to act with great secrecy and speed to get it through the French government, the cabinet, because political opinion in France, um, Monet knew, would oppose this. On the far left, of course, the communists would and did. On the far right, the Gaullists and nationalists. But even in the political center in France, from the center left, the socialists, the ra and then the radicals in the center to the central right, the Christian Democrats, there would be a lot of, of opposition. And so the coup, the Monet coup, was working with Schumann to get that through the government and then presenting it publicly in a very dramatic fashion. And it, 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 it was really a coup de théâtre, the, the, the way that the, the plan was presented, the, the, the Schumann Declaration, rather. Then there were other obstacles. Um, very quickly, um, what, what were they? Well, um, one was uh, the uh, fierce opposition of German coal producers and uh, steel owners to this. They did not want to be under any kind of control. Um, be it the International Rural Authority or the supranational control that, that uh, Schumann was proposing, if they were going to be under any kind of control or supervision, they wanted to, it to be under national control. And they began to reorganize and to lobby against the, the Schumann plan during the negotiations for the coal and steel community. And Adenauer wavered. And this is where the Americans came in. And this is where Monet's contacts with the United States came in. He very easily prevailed on the United States to have a word with Adenauer, to stiffen Adenauer's support for the Schumann Declaration. And then the Americans went to work on the German coal owners and, 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 and steel producers and, and, and pretty much crushed them, as, a, as a, I would say, as a political force. Another concern was the position of the United Kingdom. Uh, Monet was a, an Anglophile, he, he liked the UK, but he understood the UK well and he knew that the United Kingdom would oppose participating in negotiations if the price of entry into the negotiations was accepting from the outset the principle of supranationalism. And Monet knew that if he revealed his plan in advance to the United Kingdom, they would try to quash it. They were not opposed to international cooperation, far, far from it, but to the principle of supranationalism. Nationalism. So what did uh, um, Monet do? Essentially, he cut them out. He did not inform them in advance of the Schumann Declaration. Of course, he informed the Americans. He would have had to, but not the Brits. And the Brits never forgave him for that. And I think the Foreign Office distrusted him um, subsequently uh, for that. And then um, another obstacle which arose during the negotiations, and, and this almost destroyed the initiative, was, of course, following the outbreak of the war in Korea, which happened, by the way, only a month after the uh, Schumann Declaration. Um, five months later, the United States announced that they wanted German rearmament. They wanted Germany to be able to raise a military force uh, to help with the defense of, 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 of Western Europe, especially in the context, obviously, of the um, deepening Cold War. This was a very serious threat because, of course, many critics of the Schumann Declaration in France had said, oh, the next thing is they'll want to rearm Germany. And here is it, it, exactly that seemed to be happening very soon after the war and very soon after the Schumann Declaration. So what Monet did was, again, to talk to the Americans to explain the sensitivity of this. They understood anyway, but to explain the sensitivity of this. 
and to come up with a plan. And the plan, of course, was for the European defense community and then an umbrella European political community. But I would like to make the point that I don't think Monet was enthusiastic about this at all. I think he, he launched the plan for European defense community pretty much because he had to in order to protect the negotiations which were still taking place for the coal and steel community. And indeed, just jump, jumping slightly ahead, as, as, as many of the audience will know, I'm sure, the European defense community proposal was defeated in the French National Assembly in a vote in August of, of 1954. And that vote is often presented as having precipitated a crisis for the process of European integration. In my view, and I suspect in Monet's view, it actually resolved a potential crisis because had the European defense community gone ahead, there would have been such implacable opposition to it in France, even if it had received the majority support in Parliament, public opinion, and especially at the extremes, the communists and the nationalists on the right would have made the EDC unworkable. And I think that the removal of defense from the agenda of European integration was a huge relief not just to Monet, but other advocates of, 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 of economic cooperation and political integration. So finally, um, uh, the negotiations for the coal and steel community proceeded uh, successfully. The idea was to establish a common market in coal and steel under the uh, supervision, if you like, of the high authority. Uh, Monet's um, institutional architecture was very sparse. He felt that uh, the high authority and a court which could adjudicate disputes uh, would be adequate. Uh, but the negotiators themselves, the representatives of national governments felt otherwise. First of all, they insisted on having a council of ministers because even though they accepted the principle of supranationalism, they wanted to be able to influence or control developments as much as possible. And uh, the, the, the other thing, um, of course, is their insistence on having, let's face it, at least the veneer of democratic uh, legitimacy at the European level. And that was the genesis of the Common Assembly, uh, which subsequently became the, um, the European Parliament. And I, I know that Monsieur Bertrand uh, mentioned Monet's support for the European Parliament subsequently <laughs> in Monet's career, uh, but Monet never gave much time to the need for or the importance of a common assembly, a European assembly, until, by the way, he became president of the high authority when he, when he realized that the common assembly, even in its infancy, only two or three years old at that stage, could be very useful to the high authority in um, battles, conflicts, or, or the, the, the general interinstitutional dynamic which took place between the high authority and the uh, and the and the council. Why don't I leave it at that, uh, Anthony, um, and and let the other panelists contribute, and then we can take it from there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Desmond. You've set the scene uh, beautifully, if I may say so, uh, and really um, reminded us of some of the very um, uh, deep and intricate politics that surrounded the uh, initiative to share. Um, sovereignty on a supranational scale. And somebody who's written a great deal about the EU as a political system and compared and contrasted it notably with that of another federal system, namely the United States, is Sergio Fabrini, who, like Desmond, holds a Jean Monnet chair. And he's professor of political science at Luis University in Rome. Uh, he also has visiting a professorship at uh, University of, uh, of California, Berkeley, and has written many books and articles on the history and the dynamics of European integration, notably compound democracies, which European Union, and most recently Europe's future, decoupling and reforming. And thank you very much, Sergio, for joining us from Rome. Over to you. Thank you very much, Anthony, for having me here. Um, I, I, I would like, as a political scientist, I cannot enter in the historical debate. I use history uh, in light of um, current event. So I would like to uh, to touch uh, three aspects of, say, Monet legacy in political terms. The first one is Monet as a, an institution builder. Um, certainly, to my reading, uh, Monet had a keen perception of the importance uh, of the institution. However, for him, institution should preside over 
sectoral policies, not large scale projects. Uh, the European coal and steel community uh, is probably the most important example of policy regime that he promoted. Uh, also, the European defense community, although it was not the leader there, as Desmond uh, said before, uh, also the European defense community was considered by him uh, a significant uh, occasion for moving this sectoral direction. Uh, at the same time, he was very suspicious of larger projects. Indeed, uh, Jean Monnet is credited to have been the father of the, the European economic community, of the common market. Indeed, uh, Jean Monnet did not, uh, let's say, was not so enthusiastic about the uh, European economic uh, community. He was much more, let's say, positive with regard to uh, Eurotom, uh, the, the other Treaty of Rome 1957. However, at the very end, uh, it was the European economic community that should be the most successful project in the uh, in the process of European integration. And around the uh, economic uh, community, you have a process of constitutionalization of market transaction uh, in terms of uh, transforming those full freedom in a sort of quasi constitutional principle. And, and, uh, and the single European Act of 1987 is the triumph of this uh, project. So, in a way, uh, the first, let's say, point, the problematic point is that we celebrate uh, the European economic community, but Monet was much more sensitive to se sectorial policy. So uh, here there is a, a mismatch in some way. What, what they have in common is a kind of approach that is very, at least to my reading, very uh, Monetian, namely the muddling through, the, the, the the, uh, the approach based on pragmatic uh, solution. So here is the first point of discussion. Um, we consider Monet the father of the, the, of the, of the common market. Also, Monet was not as uh, supporter of that project as we assume. The second point has to do with supranationalism. Of course, I'm talking about items that are crucial for uh, political science debate. So uh, Jean Monnet has been credited of having uh, invented uh, the so-called functionalist approach. Uh, functionalist or neo-functionalist have continued and continue still today to rely on, uh, on him for legitimizing their apolitical, if not uh, technocratic approach to policy making. So, uh, this view that Monet is the father of uh, functionalism and is in some way the, uh, the, uh, the god of the culture uh, shared by many members of the European Commission, this view has been questioned by historian and political scientists. Uh, indeed, uh, Bernie Haas, who was professor from Berkeley when I was there, uh, who attended the high authority uh, when the high authority was uh, chaired or directed by Jean Monnet in Luxembourg, uh, was probably more instrumental than uh, Monet himself in creating this idea. He gave a theory to a practice. Um, and the core of the theory is the core is based on this idea of this policy spillover that uh, Anthony you raised several times. A solution creates a new problem that generates the need for a new solution. And in this process, for Bernias, uh, the main actor um, was and is should be the Commission, uh, namely an independent executive institution. In that case, for the high authority. Uh, later was the Commission, and so the Commission was much less, let's say, supranational than the high authority. So through policy solution, uh, that was the, the political consequences, but let's say an, an undeclared political consequences, the loyalty of the citizen 
would move indirectly from the national uh, to the supranational level. So the neo functionalism uh, from Bernie's from world is a celebration of policy without politics. Uh, is a, the idea that you can display identity uh, from one level to another uh, without democracy in a way, without the democratic process. Uh, probably you need to have the support of uh, well oriented, the well-educated statements, as Desmond said, he, he probably only understood that the real player of this, of this game, that they should be convinced, persuaded. Um, however, this is a celebration of policy without politics. And this is also brought to the increasing role of the, the economics profession in uh, uh, European Union affair within the Commission in all the European Union institutions. So it is true that Jean, Jean Bonnet was wary of uh, uh, legislative institution, uh, parliamentary assembly, probably that was the experience of a Frenchman uh, during the uh, Fourth uh, Fifth Republic. And, uh, and, and, and more, he was more let's say, interested in uh, uh, creating the condition for having a dialogue um, with, the, uh, with the high level politician. Uh, um, in a way, we have to think that Monet was very positive in um, activating the European Council, uh, which is, in my view, the true elephant now in the room, in the European room. Uh, and, um, and in a way, he thought that politics was an interplay between high-level politicians and very uh, well-educated, uh, uh, let's say, um, executive technocrats. So here, yeah, one might argue that he was uh, a supranationalist, uh, convinced, however, that the autonomy of an executive agency, as the higher the authority, was necessary for solving problem, although it should be uh, taken into consideration the view of the national government. But the, in, in some way, Monet thought that he was able to integrate the view of the national government within the functioning of the high authority. Uh, and the legacy, the legacy of this approach is still uh, is much more complicated. Indeed, what we have uh, today in the European Union is a, a clear distinction between uh, supranational institution and intergovernmental institution, uh, and this distinction has become more and more conflictual, contrasted, um, as we saw in a very, uh, I would say, theatrical way in Ankara, uh, where there was um, a, a race for uh, try to, to represent Europe by the uh, European Council President and the Commission President. So this is another legacy that is highly questionable uh, that should be uh, taken into consideration for making a, a, a general uh, balance of Jean Monnet. Finally, um, is Jean Monnet a federalist? A lot of people uh, think that Jean Monnet was clearly a federalist. Um, indeed, he used uh, in several occasions the word federalism. Uh, the Schumann uh, Declaration uh, used federalism twice, uh, short, it's a short declaration and used federalism twice. But uh, notwithstanding his long attendance of US policymaker, which this is interesting for me, uh, as Anthony, you said before, he, he didn't have a clear idea of what federalism uh, meant. And uh, he has a very pragmatic view of federal. Um, and if you look at the Schumann Declaration, for him, federalism um, consists in pooling, not sharing. And pooling, um, pooling power, pooling resources is a, is a um, quite, uh, say, executive-based idea of federalism. Mm, and in a way, for him, Federer was a catch word uh, to use politically, but without a clear substance. However, this uh, explains uh, 
several important development that uh, follow uh, this uh, idea uh, of federalism as a kind of catchword political concept. One is that very soon the, the very word federalism disappeared from the debate. It was uh, substituted by unity and, and of course, the, the success of the concept of integration. You don't know exactly what does it mean integration. Nobody can say what does it can be many type of integration. Integration becomes a neutral concept that uh, defines the rule of the game. At the same time, however, especially within the European Parliament, as a reaction of uh, the technocratic you know, functional approach, a political approach of the Commission, you have a, um, an underlying uh, line of thought that interprets, um, let's say, federalism as a sort of uh, end of a process with a um, powerful state-like feature. In my view, in my research, this has to do a lot with the influence within the European Parliament of the German Christian Democrats and the German Social Democrats, the, the, the powerful delegation uh, within the European Parliament. The, the idea was that basically the European Union might move uh, in direction of a German type of federation, uh, fusion between levels, um, administrative centralization in market making, uh, comitology, uh, the, the, the council like a Bundesrat, and finally the Spitzenkandidat. So the European Parliament has been trapped uh, in this, let's say, German syndrome, uh, triggering a sort of European Council uh, rebalancing. And today we have a fight between these two institutions, which were not existence at the moment of creation, the European Parliament and European Council. And, uh, and because both were, let's say, uh, driven by wrong theory. Uh, and, and the fact that there is this fight and the, the, the European Parliament insists on the Spitzenkandidat German evolution of the uh, European Union, where the European Council insists on the idea that the European Union should be a sort of executive federation uh, or intergovernmental federation in the ND uh, view. This is an idea of the fact that federalism used by uh, Monet and people around him at the very beginning of the process was misunderstood. Uh, so here, I think we have one of the questions that the Congress on the future of Europe, what else uh, should uh, should deal with, is a reinvention, a reformulation, a redefinition of the concept of uh, federal. Anthony, I will stop here. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sergio. Very, uh, very interesting and exciting insights there, um, and uh, ones that there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to pick up on if they want in the question and answer session. Just to remind you that after our four speakers have uh, completed this round, there'll be an opportunity for anybody from the floor to come in, ask a question or uh, make a comment. Please do this either in the chat function or in what's called Q&A support. And I'll try and hoover up as many of these as I can uh, towards the end of the um, ongoing conversation. So thank you, Sergio, for that. Um, our next speaker is uh, Heather Graby, Director of the Open Society European Policy Institute uh, in Brussels and a veteran think tanker. She was previously uh, Deputy Head of the Centre for European Reform in London, an academic of some distinction in her own right, having um, studied and taught at uh, Oxford, Birmingham and LSE and the author of the European Union's Transformative Powers, as well as many pamphlets and monographs over uh, recent decades. And I think one of the thought leaders in many ways of the evolution of EU policy and institutions. And she recently said, and I thought it was an extremely powerful insight, that the European Union was less good at managing immediate crises than it was in developing, projecting, and in, indeed delivering transformative agendas whether we go back to the customs union and single market or to a monetary union and enlargement. So I suppose one of the questions really is, is the biggest single transformative agenda Monet's vision of Europe? Yeah. Over to you, Heather. Thank you very much, Anthony. I, I'm really enjoying having this discussion today um, amid um, a renewed set of uh, political debates about the EU and 
does it has it succeeded has it failed um the the reams of uh newsprint that have been expended on vaccine procurement as as if that had been one of the primary objectives that the eu was set up for and its institutions were designed to deliver um, and so it's really helpful to have this discussion at this point and to think about the nature of the beast. And uh, I've really enjoyed the way that uh, Desmond and Sergio have, have really set out how many of these tensions have been there from the very beginning between the political aspirations of European politicians for the union and for um, supranational decision making. And on the other hand, the, how the institutions are actually designed and the way that the policies are made. And this constant disjuncture between the two has created inevitably um, what's called in the political science literature a capability expectations gap for the citizen, where they hear very grand sounding objectives and aspirations um, spoken by political leaders at EU level. And then you find that what the institutions produce is policies, particularly sectoral policies, that are in fact very important as Jean Monnet uh, wanted them to be, um, and yet which it's very hard to, to kind of see the, the, uh, the direct connection uh, between them. Um, and it was a great pleasure listening to Georges Bertrand, who um, it was so interesting because but the, the challenges he was talking about that drove Monet into this in the first place are still with us. Suez Canal crisis, for example, we've just had another one. Um, definitely the way that coal and steel are fundamentally back on the agenda. That's what the European Green Deal is all about, transforming the steel and the coal sectors um, across Europe and, and also beyond. And of course, the, the question he mentioned about industrialization and the role of the German economy and how can the rest of Europe live with um, the, the power of German industry. So um, these, these are still highly relevant issues. Um, and I just want to, to, to dive into two aspects of, of Monet's legacy, which are especially relevant today. One is about sovereignty, and the other one is about law, the role of law. Now, we've um, had some discussion already about what kind of sovereignty um, he uh, favored or supranational um, and what kind of supranational vision he put forward with Sergio arguing that actually he was about, he believed in pooling power and resources, not necessarily sharing them and having the executive as the basis. And that's still actually very much the dominant view in the European Union, I would argue. That's why the European Council, that invention of another Gaullist, Giscard d'Estaing, by the way, um, the European Council has been a consistent winner of each crisis. That ironically, the spillover effect, the famous um, uh, functionalist argument, has actually driven more power to the European Council, I would argue, and away from the Commission in terms of decision making power. Um, because in a crisis, you need rapid decisions. It's very difficult for a complex institutional setup where uh, things move at the speed of the slowest member of the convoy to make rapid decisions. So as we've had a series of crises over the past decade and a half or so uh, in Europe, that's meant that decisions have often been pushed up to the level of the heads and state and government, even if they don't really need to be involved actually at, at that level of detail. And I, I think Monet would probably have been quite horrified at seeing how much they've been haggling late at night um, over, over really what might you might have the details that, that are far beyond the capacity of, of very tired heads of state and government. Um, but that's, that's happened because um, those decisions could only be taken in this kind of supranational system um, by the very top level of politics, by those who've been not only directly uh, elected by, uh, by their own uh, voters, but those who actually represent their countries as well. So they've got that double uh, representation uh, 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 function. So this is, I think, a very interesting question is, is kind of what does um, what does sovereignty mean? And it's come to be about in, in the EU, it's the, the redux of sovereignty has become that decision must be taken by the European Council. Now, we can argue about how democratic that really is, given the opacity of decision making there. And indeed, of course, the fact that um, the sometimes the leaders there only have a rather short passage um, in that body because uh, they get thrown out of office, in which case, how much have they really represented their the the, um, the interests of their constituencies over the long term. But that that is essentially what's become the rule of thumb or, or the de facto, the facts on the ground um, within the European Union. Um, but it's also um, very important to recognize the role of institutions, um, something that, that Desmond uh, brought out in particular, um, the way that um, this, um, the, how, how useful um, 
uh, Monet ended up finding having a veneer of democratic legitimacy through the common assembly uh, when he saw the institutional dynamics were going to be very tricky and that remains the case um, and although I think now the European Parliament has got a role for itself which is which is rather beyond that I think the veneer has become much much deeper you'll be glad to hear all of you um, listening into an EPRS event um, but what's it, what I think is especially important is um, the way that um, the parliament has actually itself engaged in the sovereignty debate and has enriched the notion of sovereignty at EU, EU level from being um, the idea that uh, countries are sovereign if their governments are sovereign, if they have power, to the idea that peoples are sovereign and that peoples aren't necessarily very well served by their governments and that they might have a longer term interest. And I think this question of timeline of sovereignty is very important because one of the things that Monet did in setting up the EU as, as he did, as he and I, I'm using him, of course, as shorthand for the whole panoply of people he worked with and so on. But the, the way that he put forward the, the Monet method and the institutional um, structures that he, he managed to create with Schumann and, and so on have led to um, a timeline for EU policymaking, which is quite different from that for national governments. Now, that's partly because he came from planning, um, as, as Desmond was saying to us earlier. He came from the French notion of you must have a five year, at least a five year plan and you have a commissariat du plan. And this idea that planning is fundamental to good policymaking. Um, this is a this is something that lost favor later. Um, when uh, there was the, well, you could argue the Thatcherite arguments for, for the state should have less of a role. It's not for the state to plan things. It's for the private sector to create things. But in fact, the EU level has always been much better at this in taking the long view. And that's why it has managed to have, I would argue, transformative effects by setting up policy frameworks that eventually took on a life and a logic of their own. And I would argue that goes very well with Monet's idea of the petit pas, that um, you can have sectoral policy um, but you can actually situate those within grander projects um, and you, you might move along at petit pas within the project but if you have as your ultimate goal to create an economic community um, in, in, or indeed to enlarge um, the European Union so that it covers the whole of, of Europe um, east and west or indeed now the very big projects to uh, transform the economy into a sustainable and green and, and climate friendly economy, or indeed a, um, to have a, a digital uh, world that is also democratic and serves the public interest. These are very big objectives. And actually you need a whole plethora of sectoral policies in order to get there. And so the EU, by being able to plan for longer than the usual four or five year electoral time horizon and to bring sectoral policies together, for example, as the European Green Deal does by by bringing them together under, under a meta project. Um, that's a, that's something that really can only be done um, at, at supranational level. Um, it has been done at national level, but it can't be done for a highly interdependent set of economies in a global um, set of capital flows and institutions and so on, like the kind we live in. It just wouldn't make sense. It, it cannot be. These are issues that cannot be addressed by one country alone. So by taking the, the French idea of planning and giving it to institutions at EU level, actually Monet set up something really quite extraordinary. But of course, he has left, and I'll just finish with, with two points that I think um, I would be very interested in, in Andrew Ravchik's view on how Monet might have uh, might have thought about these, especially knowing how he reacted to the idea of the defense community and so on. But he's left us with two anomalies, um, two retrofits to his model that have never really worked. And I'm curious to know whether um, the august historians here think how, how Monet might have thought about them. So the first one is, of course, external policies, which were brought in. He, of course, did think about the whole question of should there be an army, and if so, who, who would decide when the army goes into battle. Um, but external policies have always been a retrofit. Um, they've always been the awkward wings uh, which have been stuck on the side of the EU, of the European tank. The tank is very good at trundling along slowly, steadily, um, but then you try and give it wings and expect it to take off. It's really difficult to do that. And uh, we're just about to celebrate 10 years of the external action service. And things are still really very difficult on the external side. We see that with, for example, the European Green Deal, that the external implications and spillover effects for the rest of the world haven't really been taken into account. So how might, um, given that um, external policies are not just about defense and military, but also about trade and all the other things that the EU does, how might Monet have, have addressed, it that, addressed that question of how do you re retrofit them in? 
Um, and the second one is, of course, about the issue of, of, um, of the law, um, because he supported setting up um, the um, having a, um, a court to adjudicate disputes between uh, countries. And the, the scope of EU law has gone much further than that. The remit of the European, the Court of Justice of the European Union has, of course, gone a lot further. But now we're seeing member states, particularly uh, the governments in Budapest and Warsaw, contesting the uh, decisions made by the court. Um, and th this, is, this is a very new area of a, of a dispute over sovereignty, uh, sovereignty over law and whether the community of law of the EU can continue. And uh, it's quite remarkable that last uh, December, the commission agreed to a member state demand at the European Council that uh, a commission proposal should be put to the Court of Justice before it was actually implemented. Um, that was a really hist historically a, a, a legal precedent um, for the commission to agree to do that. Um, now, that's not something that perhaps Monet might have thought about, but I think an interesting question is, can there be a new fight over sovereignty between the European Council um, and the Court of Justice of the EU if other member states start to go the same way and start to contest the outcome of court decisions. I'll leave it there. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Heather. Uh, not only some extremely powerful insights themselves, but some very good questions uh, in the absence of, uh, of other questions. Questions are beginning to come in from the audience, and please don't hold back in that regard. Um, because I'd like to um, uh, put one or two questions which are in the same areas together and ask our distinguished panel to comment on them. And the final panelist in that distinguished panel is none other than mm -hmm. Anthony Rafshik, who's been one of the most influential shapers of thinking about the evolution of EU institutions in recent decades. He's Professor of Politics and Head of the EU Programme at Princeton University, and his his book in 1998, The Choice for Europe, Social Purpose and State Power from Messina to Maastricht, I think was perhaps one of the most influential books in the last quarter century or perhaps even the last half century, perhaps even since the uniting of, of Europe by Ernst Haas uh, that was referred to earlier on in shaping people's understanding of the EU institutions. And I think it's fascinating that two American political scientists should have been so influential in shaping the discipline, and I don't think that's just because of the power of American academia, I think it's because of the capacity to see the evolution of federal systems based upon the US experience. And he's going to reflect, uh, hopefully in uh, a su suitably um, anti-establishment way, as I know your analysis tends to challenge conventional wisdom, on the place and role of Jean Monnet in the history of European integration. Over to you, Andrew, and thank you incidentally so much for joining us direct from the United States at this relatively early hour. Thanks very much, Anthony, for including me and for the compliments. Um, I would say I knew Ernie Haas and I'm no Ernie Haas, but uh, uh, it's a wonderful thing to remember him. I also want to second your greeting to my friend Rene Hafferkamp, who's in the audience, uh, like Professor Dine, and I find it a pleasure to speak about EU, uh, EU history. But it must be an even greater pleasure to have lived it, as Rene Hafferkamp and also Monsieur Patouin uh, did. Um, I just want to draw two enduring lessons from Monet's experience, one about the motivations for integration and the other about the politics of integration, building on things that others have said. But let me start with one story. Um, so one day about 20 years ago, um, Max Konstam called me up. Now Max Konstam, as many of you know, uh, was a distinguished collaborator of Monet since about 1950. And Konstam calls me up, he explains to me that he and others were forming a committee of scholars to assist in developing something called the Maison Musée Jean Monnet in Evelyne outside of Paris, uh, in Monet's old villa. Uh, that institution now, as I understand it, belongs to the European Parliament, somewhat controversially, I understand. And uh, so Konstam continues by asking, did I have any thoughts about this museum for Jean Monnet? Uh, and with the typical intemperance of a, of a then young scholar, I told him what I thought. Um, I said the museum should emphasize the ironies of history because even the greatest visionaries like Monet don't usually see the future clearly. 
And Monet got it wrong over and over again in his career. For example, I added, in 1955-56, he almost strangled the European economic community in the crib, opposing it passionately and trying to convince Adenauer to kill it. Um, because he didn't think that it fit with his view of what integration could or should be. There was a long pause on the other side of the uh, end of the line. And then Konstam said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, in the 50s, um, Monet wanted an atomic energy and transport union from which little resulted in the end and desperately wanted to kill the customs union. Um, and he told his closest associate at the time, Pierre Uri, that the customs union had no political potential. It couldn't promote integration. And he went to Adenauer and told him, please get rid of it. Uh, fortunately, Adenauer rejected Monet's plea and forced Monet to go along with the customs union, which Monet then did. Um, and Adenauer did this because German business said that they hated the coal and steel community and that if the other, if the countries went forward with just transport and atomic energy without the customs union, the German business would publicly come out against the German government and the customs union. And Adenauer couldn't afford that, so he forced Monet to go along with him. Um, and, and, and the rest is history, right? So there's an even longer pause on the other end of the phone. And Konstam says, where did you get this information? So I said, well, it's not really very controversial. The historian Ellen Millward pointed this out, some of it. Um, and Jean Monnet's longtime collaborator and admirer, Francois Duchesne, in his unparalleled biography of Monet, which I would recommend to you all, um, uh, also, also talks about this. And being a young scholar, I immodestly added that I too had written a recent book on, on the EU, and I checked the documents, and this story checked out. So this time, Constant was very quick in his response. Thank you very much, Professor. Good day. Click. And that is the last I ever heard from Max Constant or the committee to advise the Maison Musée Jean Monnet. Um, and what the story tells us, I think, is that there's a big difference between the political myth of Monet 50 years ago and what actually happened. Um, and what exactly are those differences and what do they teach us about integration? And again, I just want to raise two issues, one about motivations and one about politics. So I do think that we all agree here on motivations that um, Jean Monnet was profoundly right about something. And that was that pragmatic problem solving in an interdependent world, not idealism or federal dreams, it is the decisive motivation behind European integration and in fact, multilateral cooperation everywhere. Jean Monnet was a pragmatist. He was profoundly correct in seeing early on that the way to regional integration and the way to international cooperation generally in this day and age runs through functional problem solving. Enduring and effective regional and global institutions are those that solve very practical problems, immediate problems for states and for the people that those states represent. Cooperation is not an exercise in federalist idealism. Constitutional debates for their own sake, such as those held in Europe 10 or 20 years ago, uh, aren't just not the point. They're counterproductive because they distract you from this problem solving effort. It would be civilian economic cooperation that would bring Europe together. And Professor Dynan's comments on the EDC, I think, are right on point. Monet had an ambivalent relationship to the EDC, and it wasn't these security concerns per se that were the motive factor pushing Europe forward. To be sure, as early as 1945, um, when he was in charge of French Reconstruction, Monet was encouraged by the Americans to think this way, uh, actually, about um, rebuilding Europe. But he embraced it, he made it his own, and that is a, the most profound insight that differs, uh, that, that distinguishes Monet from other people who talk about or practice European integration. So that's on the motivations, where he's profoundly right. But I think he was profoundly wrong in many ways about the politics of integration. Because the politics of integration have proven to be, as, as Heller Grabe 
just pointed out, that the self-interest of democratically accountable national leaders and their constituents, not the visions of a Brussels-based technocracy or independent thinkers like Monet himself in later career, is the decisive force behind integration and indeed all international cooperation. And this lesson about Europe, we learned from Monet's mistakes. His experience in government as others have pointed out, was almost entirely as an economic planner. He was what the French called a dirigiste, a believer in state management of the economy, not markets and courts and things like that. He was a technocrat, not a politician, even though he was a superb networker and knew how to go talk to people, but he himself was not really a politician. Um, that's how he thought about integration, and that's why his method was to select the strategic sectors of the economy. He thought he, he wanted to begin with sectors that were nationalized, that were essential to the state, where the state was very involved, such as coal and steel, and then continue with issues such as atomic energy and transport. The logic of this was twofold. First, since states intervene in these sectors a lot and care about them, and in those days, particularly manage them day to day, Running them supranationally would require the transfer of authority to a technocratic bureaucracy that stood above the states. And this would promote integration. This is how you would get from functional cooperation to political integration. Secondly, and perhaps more at the level of ideology than reality, but still it was important in 1950 for sure, since these sectors are necessary for modern warfare, states would eventually find that they are unable to make war unilaterally because these sectors are being managed collectively, or so the ideology went. Um, and as Professor Dynan rightly pointed out, he was opposed to the creation or uninterested in the creation of a European Council or a forum for the member states until the very last year of his life when he got on board with something that, that Giscard and, and de Gaulle and others had done for years. Um, so Monet tried his method out, and the lesson of European integration is that it failed. Um, the grand aspirations of the coal and steel community were basically failures. Historians now agree on that. It did restore production of coal and steel and some trade, but it did not, in the end, transfer control over coal and steel to a supranational authority. And Monet himself was a close to a failure as head of the high authority in 52 to 55. He had relatively little political sense, alienated both the French political elite and the German business elite, um, and they ousted him. Um, in 1955 to 57, Eurotum was what he wanted, a common effort in the energy sector, and not the launching uh, of the customs union in 1957. The launching of the customs union was not an extension of the coal and steel community, it was a replacement for the coal and steel community. It changed the philosophy of the European Union fundamentally to something far more market-oriented, far more general, far less dirigiste, uh, far broader, uh, and ultimately far more legalistic than what he had in mind. And this was done, as I mentioned before, at the behest of politicians and particularly business people. Um, and that's why Monet initially opposed it, because he simply couldn't see how this would lead to political integration as he imagined it. He did eventually reverse his position because, as I said, he was a pragmatist. He went along with what the member states uh, and uh, powerful interests wanted to do. It was not the last time that he would adopt other people's ideas and get credit for them, um, but it was not his idea. He also didn't really grasp the importance of the common agricultural policy, which turned out to be the policy that really pushed the European Union forward uh, in the 1960s and encouraged in the mid 1960s, uh, the commission president then Walter Hallstein to call Charles de Gaulle's bluff, uh, precipitating the empty chair crisis and almost leading to the collapse of the EEC. Again, he didn't have great political judgment in some of these things. Um, and the EU we see today, as Heather mentioned, and Sergio as well, is in most respects uh, something very different than the hierarchical, essentially apolitical or quasi-political administrative bureaucracy that Monet envisaged. 
It is a network of highly interdependent, like-minded states that coordinate their activities through markets, um, through bureaucratic interaction, through the constitutionalization of, of legal processes, uh, through common democratic and regulatory values under a commission far less powerful than the old uh, high authority was. States are still sovereign. They always will be sovereign, as Brexit, Brexit shows us. But they choose, and they choose repeatedly, to combine their actions or pool their actions into, into common projects. And this is a road to regional peace and cooperation, despite its functionality, uh, that Monet really couldn't imagine. Um, and uh, I think Heather Graber pointed out the most important um, proof of this, which is the fact that in the last 30 years, the council has become the dominant institution in Europe. And that is something that was just completely foreign to Monet. And the reason is because national officials and only national officials or national politicians are the decisive actors because they are political, not technocratic, because only they are accountable directly in an everyday sense to the public. Only they know what people want, what special interests want, can judge in real time the political trade-offs that have to be made for a sustainable deal, and they have to because their political survival depends on it. In this regard, the irony of Monet is that he played a decisive and creative role in European integration at only one point in the 75 history, year history of European integration, and that was at the very start in 1950. And at that moment, he was not a free-floating intellectual. He was not the head of the high authority. He was a French state official in charge of French policy of reconstruction. And as Professor Dynan pointed out, his motivations were very French, as well as being uh, cosmopolitan and visionary for pursuing the policies he did in promoting the Schumann plan. He wanted to, to promote the French government's self-interested need for German coal and for the re uh, creation of the French steel industry. He wanted to strengthen non-communist Western Europe against the Soviet Union and he wanted to forward regional peace and cooperation. And part of his calling card was that he got along with the great power of those days, the superpower, the United States. Um, this is the classic job of a diplomat. It was very creatively done in a way that changed history, but it was not really a supranational mission that he carried out at that point and very little in the rest of Monet's life we can talk about it as head of the action committee I think was essential what well, was essential to European integration so I think we have a case here of somebody where the myth is very different than the reality but if we look at the reality we learn something very fundamental about what's possible and what's not possible in regional integration and why um, and those lessons still endure uh, today, whether they stem from Rene's vision and successes or from his lack of vision and his failures. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. That was great. Uh, a lot of questions now coming in. I'm going to, and um, we've got about a quarter of an hour or so. So rather than ask the panel to respond to each of the questions individually, I'm going to just quickly run through the ones that have come in so far. Uh, certainly that have caught my eye and uh, give you each an opportunity to uh, respond to whichever components you think uh, are interesting and important. Um, first of all, a, a kind of academic question. Uh, Ralph Drakenberg asks, um, which theoretical approaches to European integration do you believe individually are best suited to understanding the history of the EU past and present? That's probably one that will appeal to uh, the three professors. Um, Antonio Caiola asked the question, how do you see the relationship between a more explicit form of European sovereignty and the development of a European identity. Uh, Daniel Komen asks, um, how do you think Jean Monnet, if he were alive today, would, ta would have tackled the 2008 financial crisis or indeed the coronavirus crisis today? Uh, Raymond uh, Nerechak, excuse me if I've got the pronunciation wrong, um, says, to what degree in your view was the European Union founded without uh, public uh, legitimacy. 
Uh, Roberto Bendini asks you to explore perhaps in a little more detail the interaction with the United States in all of this and the comparative motivations between Washington, Paris and Bonn. There's been reference to French interests here and I think in my introduction I commented in the degree to which it was a brilliant solution to a particular problem in Paris but obviously it wouldn't have worked but for the fact that there was a mutuality of interest more uh, broadly uh, perhaps with the exception of London that fitted together. Uh, and uh, in another reflection on the current uh, state of the European Union, Peter Hall asks you, taking advantage of the presence of so many strong political scientists, if you'd like to draw any comparisons between the um, political significance and style of the Juncker and the von der Leyen commissions, and without opening up a huge debate about the Spitzenkandidaten, whether or not you think um, some of the authority or lack of it, of whichever, might uh, followed, have followed from the mode of selection of the Commission President. And I myself would like to throw in a question about spillover. Mention has been made of Ernst Haas and the neo-functionalists. How far do you think that Monet expected or believed that there would be a spillover effect? And how far do you think that spillover is an important concept in understanding the evolution of the EU, particularly during the Delors era in the 1980s and 90s. So over to you, and I'm going to ask Heather to give her thoughts first on any or all of those uh, questions. Right, I'm going to be very selective and just pick up um, the last two uh, because uh, we're in the presence of, of historians and I'm much more of a political scientist. Um, and also um, I've only really worked on, on the EU um, since 1989. Um, so um, just, I just really wanted to, to uh, look at this question of spill, spillover that Anthony raised and also the, the comparisons between styles. So I'll give you a, a controversial uh, statement to begin with. Um, the selection of the commission president, the, the method of selection of commission president, um, matters greatly at the moment when it happens, but over the five-year term of the commission, it comes to matter far less than the output legitimacy of what that that president or what that commission produces. So it's a, it's 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 all about political myth versus reality, as as Andrew Moravchik was pointing out earlier. Also with these, um, so I, I would argue that um, the fact that um, Juncker was chosen through the formal Spitzenkandidat um, procedure and that von der Leyen um, was ultimately uh, picked out by the European Council and overrode the, the procedure is of pretty small significance in comparison with um, the way they're judged at the end of their term on delivery. Um, and of course, the, the jury is still out. As Aristotle tells us, call no person happy until he or she is dead. Call no commission president successful until the very end of their term and they're out of office. But, um, you know, von der Leyen is being very much judged at the moment on rollout of vaccine procurement, something which the EU institutions were manifestly not designed to, to do, and which uh, the Commission has had to retrofit to its agenda extremely rapidly. Um, and with, you know, some very tricky political conundrums along the way, let alone pharmaceutical companies and, and all the rest of it. But, you know, Juncker um, has benefited a great deal, um, like, you know, every, every politician does in office, by the circumstances at the end of his uh, of his uh, um, uh, tenure um, in the commission, um, which was pretty good, but there were a lot of very bumpy points along the road, and that's kind of been forgot forgotten about. And I would argue that the problem with the Spitzenkandidat system is not that it uh, that it selects uh, better or worse quality leaders. I don't think that's that's its function. It's that it it seems to offer a democratic choice, but in practice doesn't do so. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but on the spillover point, I think this is really important because it's, it's absolutely true that in any um, political system, um, the solution of one problem creates new problems that there will need to be new solutions for. So that the fundamentals of, of functionalism do work. But of course, there are political choices made in terms of which solutions to take or which problems to tackle. So the agenda setting role of of the Commission remains very important because the Commission decides what is a problem that should be taken up by the European Union. So the right of initiative remains a really important power of the Commission um, because, you know, and, and this relates back to the question about 2008 um, and or indeed Corona, um, in deciding which aspect of contemporary problems
problems are suitable for the EU to take up and for the Commission to put forward proposals on, that's where the power lies. So I would say the agenda setting dimension um, is really where the spillovers really, really matter. Um, and that's, of course, something not surprising that the European Parliament has been trying to get in on the Act with proposals that it should also have some kind of right of initiative, uh, because that's what determines which spillovers become um, the next part of, of the functionalist story. I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you very much indeed, Heather. Uh, next, uh, Desmond. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Um, uh, Ralph's question about a uh, theory and, and your last question about spillover are related, of course, because spillover is a fundamental aspect of um, the functions theory. And uh, that's associated with Ernst Task. We've mentioned him already. Um, Jean-Marie Jean himself was, was completely non-theoretical. Um, he didn't have a, a theory himself. Uh, one of the reasons why I think he welcomed Haas into the high uh, authority as a as participant observer is because he knew Haas would provide a theory of European integration, which indeed was very congenial to Monet himself, and Monet liked the idea of spillover. Uh, I'm not convinced by the, by the notion of spillover. I certainly agree with, with Heather about problems being related to each other. Um, and, uh, uh, but but I think if, if you think about spillover, and, and I think you may have mentioned Delors in particular, I suppose the spillover that's associated with Delors from the single market program to economic and monetary uh, union. And in my view, economic and monetary union um, was um, not, neither automatic nor inevitable. Um, despite the Commission's mantra of one market, one money, which was very clever, very clever um, um, marketing ploy, if you like. Um, but but uh, uh, Delors contrived that spillover in, in, in a way. And, and I think that the history of economic and monetary union is very, uh, very contingent on what was happening at, at that time. We know that the move toward EMU predated the um, fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War and so forth. But, but the, the, the geopolitical context, I think, was very important in the uh, outcome of the of the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, as far as, as theories explaining European integration today is concerned, intergovernmentalism, although I'm not sure that I'm wedded to a particular adjective <laughs> before intergovernmentalism, <laughs> either liberal or new, because new is the, is the vogue now for intergovernmentalism. I think intergovernmentalism is very important, and I think we've seen that already in this discussion. I, I'm struck by how uh, prominent in the discussion the emergence and role of the European Council is. Um, and, and by the way, my own uh, view of, of Monet's involvement is that it was extremely peripheral. He was a, a grand old man at that time. Uh, Giscard asked him what he thought of the European Council. Monet said, well, of course, it's a good thing because he didn't want to be seen to be negative. And indeed, the European Council that Giscard launched bears almost no relation to the European Council today. It was just a, a, an opportunity for leaders to chat. At that time, it subsequently became very, very important. Um, but the, the, the other aspect, a, a theoretic, theoretical aspect that I would emphasize today is, is an aspect of supranationalism. And it is the role of not so much the supranational institution, but a supranational institution, and that is the European Parliament. Because I think the two institutions that are on the ascendant in the European Union today are the European Council and the European Parliament. And I think that has already come up in the, in the discussion. It's not to say that the Commission is unimportant, far, far from it. But I think for reasons of democratic legitimacy, which both the European Council and the European Parliament have, but which the Commission's, Commission lacks, and for a host of other uh, reasons as well that are, that are treaty-based, that, that, that are... Uh, central or, or understandable in the context of the institutional evolution of the European Union. These are the two in institutions that, that really matter. And therefore, I think the, the importance of national interests mediated through the European Council, but also uh, parliamentarianism, and one can call it new parliamentarianism, assertive parliamentarianism, but the increasingly central role of the European Parliament is important. And, and the final point I would make is um, the, to, to distinguish between the role of theory in explaining the, 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 the major developments, the big deals, um, which of course is central to the book, The Choice for Europe, um, and a theory explaining everyday, um, the, 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 the everyday goings on in the European, in the European Union. Um, I don't know if there are or will be any more big deals, although I think uh, July 2020 and the agreement in the European Council on not just the MFF, of course, but the recovery fund does constitute a new deal. And therefore the question is, um, how did that come about? And we know about the centrality of, of France and Germany to that agreement, but it really was a, a German decision. It was Merkel's decision to, to back that. 
that 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 I think needs to be understood, um, uh, and 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 that that certainly would would emphasise the importance of, of of national governments, national positions, and the intergovernmental uh, approach. But I think day to day, when you look at how the European Union operates, um, intergovernmental is is an, is certainly important, but parliamentarianism is the key to understanding the European Union today. Thank you very much for that, Desmond. Just a small uh, observation on my part, of course, Monet in his memoirs does say that he thinks that the European Council could help solve and suggests that one of the reasons he supported it uh, was to address this problem, a deficit in executive authority in the EU political system. In other words, he seemed to think that the European Commission didn't have fully what was required to, to meet the challenge uh, in, involved. But others say the memoirs were largely ghosted, so perhaps, in fact, um, this was an overlay, and who knows what Jean Monnet really felt, but I can't judge. What I can say, however, uh, to Andrew is that in terms of the management of the Jean Monnet House, and it is indeed uh, part of the patrimoine, as it were, of the European Parliament, and we try to use it as a centre for um, exchange and discussion on all sorts of things, and it's an increasingly important part of our portfolio in that regard. Um, we don't try and impose any kind of uh, ideological screening on people's attitudes, <laughs> either to Monet or more broadly uh, what he represented. Um, maybe Sergio next. Um, I, I, I start from uh, Anthony's um, question on spillover. Uh, certainly, Monet didn't have uh, a theory of spillover, but Bernias developed that. Uh, uh, spillover has become a, a kind of official uh, philosophy uh, in the construction of the market. And the outcome of this uh, undeclared political theory was a process of uh, administrative centralization. Uh, which is um, which is without comparison. If you compare the integration of the European uh, single market with the American single market, there is no comparison. It's much more integrated, much more centralized, uh, much more homogenized. And this uh, administrative uh, centralization of the of the single market through spillover uh, led to the mobilization of the European Parliament. And the same time, also through the invasion of national policy area to the mobilization of national parliaments. So what you have is that the spillover was, in my, at least to my interpretation, uh, the spillover is becoming the instrument for creating a sort of um, quasi-state-like organization around the market. Uh, and what happened with Brexit, I think, is an example. You cannot negotiate. Uh, macroeconomic criteria because those criteria uh, have become a sort of quasi constitutional, uh, let's say, item. So that brings uh, to the Antonio question that uh, the market uh, developed, uh, but within a sort of, let's say, regulatory area. Um, the question became very complicated when, after the end of the Cold War, uh, and that was a something that of course was out of the perspective of uh, Jean Monnet, uh, the European Union process also through this idea of spillover enter in area that were very sensitive for national sovereignty, what we call core state power, something like that, uh, defense, foreign policy, uh, intelligence, security, uh, fiscal sovereignty uh, of the, the economic and monetary union, and so in the, uh, home and justice affair, for example, the question of asylum. So when you enter, uh, you, you through this idea of spillover without a theory, uh, just to move a functional movement, you enter in those sovereignty defined area. At that point, uh, the system in, invented from Rome uh, to the single European Act couldn't work. And at that point, you have the arrival of national government. They accepted. Uh, to bring those issues in Brussels, but they accepted the condition of controlling them. And here is the idea of pooling again. You have the, the, the arrival of the European Council as the main, uh, the main institution of the process, because you are dealing with um, sovereignty sensitive, sovereignty issue. And also at that regard, uh, the Council, the European Council made possible differentiation because in the market is much more difficult. 
you don't need differentiation, it's only capability induced differentiation. What you have with the uh, post Maastricht era is differentiation in sovereignty issues. So the European Council is, is really uh, the, the winner of this, of this process because of, of a need. So at that point, to insist on the Spitzen candidate means, in my view, to generate is uh, what I call uh, a conflict uh, with, uh, very, let's say, two different logic. If you look at the very end, even Ursula von der Leyen was selected first by the European Council and then approved by the European Parliament. She is not the representative of uh, an alternative logic. She comes from the European Council, which who, that was also um, Charles Michel. So here we have the elephant in the room that this kind of development generates an institution that think, operate, decide on a European level without having a European legitimacy, but only constituted by member state leader having national legitimacy. But the one they are there, they decide on behalf of Europe. They don't decide on behalf of their own specific uh, national uh, member state. So this is, in my view, the serious problem of democracy in, in Europe. And I would say that to, to insist on parliamentarization of Europe uh, would not help uh, in solving, in dealing with that issue. This is why I talk about constitutional truths. And this is why I conclude that might be useful to start from a different kind of theory and the historical experience. Uh, that there is a federation logic, which is not the replica of the German disaggregation logic, but is also, but is in, instead the opposite, is how to aggregate member states with previously sovereign um, power uh, and sharing, uh, not only pooling their own uh, resources. But they stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, and thank you for addressing what is absolutely a central question, namely how to build and maintain legitimacy for the EU system and the inevitably intense but uh, critically important debate that surrounds that. The last word to Andrew. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with my colleagues, brilliant colleagues, about spillover and uh, these other things. So let me close by saying something about myth, and a little anecdote about myth. So there's a story in Alan Millward, probably the most distinguished historian of European integration, famously ridiculed the kind of myths about people like Monet. He called them the hagiography of European saints. Um, and you can see where he's coming from. He thought it was very important to reflect on the real pragmatic lessons that we learned, to be very clear-eyed about what the European Union is and is not. And I agree with that. But myths do matter and human beings need them to motivate themselves. And to see how powerful they can be, let me just briefly recount one of the most moving political spectacles I ever saw. It so happens that I had, completely by chance, was um, there when Jean Monnet was inducted into the Pantheon in Paris. It was the 9th of November, 1988, his 100th birthday. Um, and I was living in Paris at the time and happened to have a friend who had an apartment overlooking the Place de Pantheon. So he invites me to see this. Um, now, the Pantheon, you know when you see it in Paris, uh, they only open the grand west doors with the colon in the colonnade there to induct individuals in the Pantheon. That is the only way. Otherwise, you go all the way around back in the little door uh, on the other side. So we're, we're on this balcony overlooking this. And a procession comes down the Rue de Soufflot to the Place de, du, du Pantheon um, with Francois Mitterrand bareheaded and people carrying the casket of Monet slowly with somber music, the entire square bedecked with red, white, and blue French flags. At the instant when Monet's casket passed through the grand columns and doors into the Pantheon, an enormous European flag, light blue with gold stars the size of the entire facade of the Pantheon, fluttered down behind the columns. Um, she or, you know, sort of grasping his body 
into the Pantheon. Um, it was one of the most moving things I've ever seen in my life. And it really, if you want political spectacle, you know, go to the French or the Brits. These people really know how to do it. Nothing could have made clear the real lesson, which was not somewhere in Brussels or something like that, but that the heart of France had become more European. And having secular saints like Jean Monnet, even in most of what we believe about them isn't true, um, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing to have a few secular saints. Thank you. Well, on that note, I'd just like to say to all of you uh, what a great conversation this has been. Um, we really feel deeply honored to have you as our panel. And it's been a really fabulous uh, conversation. So um, I'm sure that uh, around the European Parliament and for those who are tuned in elsewhere, there's a, a strong appreciation for that and a kind of big virtual round of applause. And hopefully we'll have a chance to have you back on some subsequent occasion too uh, to talk about institutional developments in the European Union, because this is a story that keeps giving. And the speed in which the EU evolves, uh, it takes all of us, even those of us who have practiced hands in the, in the matter, always uh, by surprise. The next EPRS event uh, will be this Friday, Friday the 23rd of April, and it's our annual comparative law forum which this year will be devoted to the principles of equality and non-discrimination. And we have uh, justices, we have academics, we have practicing lawyers from many jurisdictions who are going to be comparing and contrasting those principles in practice. Um, so I look forward to seeing uh, as many of you as possible on Friday for that. It's an all day event, so maybe not uh, tuning in uh, throughout. Uh, and in the interim, once again, thank you so much to our very distinguished panel and Thank you also to Georges Bertoin for the fact that he joined us at the beginning and shared his reminiscences of the time that he worked with John Monet. Have a very nice afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>